On this Thursday night, the past and who we've honored colliding with the present. From street names to statues, the push to erase names with racist ties. Why would you want to identify with someone who opposed the abolition of slavery? The debate gaining momentum. The art of racial justice. It's really beautiful to see. One Alley's transformation and tribute to black lives. Playing the blame game. They blocked help liberals shamefully saying no. The bickering over disability benefits. Plus, a textbook case of stress. Why international students are in limbo. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with the growing pressure to recognize systemic racism in Canada and take action to eliminate it, especially in policing. Yesterday, the commissioner of the RCMP said while she believes there's unconscious bias, she can't say for sure if there's systemic racism in the RCMP. And she said she struggles with the definition of it. Today, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau made it clear what he thinks. Systemic racism is an issue right across the country, in all our institutions, including in all our police forces, including in the RCMP. That's what systemic racism is. So as much as we admire and support the RCMP, we know we need to do better. And it's not just the individual examples we've seen. It's the issues faced by Canadians of diverse backgrounds over years, decades, and generations. Trudeau says he does still have confidence in the RCMP commissioner. And beyond police reform, there are calls to rethink who we choose to honour from our past. In Vancouver this morning, the statue of British explorer Captain George Vancouver was found covered in paint. Similar scenes are playing out in cities around the world. Monuments to men who were once honoured now viewed by a new generation as symbols of racism and colonialism, relics of the past not standing the test of time. In some cases, city officials are taking them down themselves because of the public pressure. Here in Canada, a push is underway to take a harder look at historical names attached to our schools and our streets. One is Henry Dundas. He was a big political figure from Scotland in the 19th century, Tonight, Eric Sorensen looks at the campaign to wipe his name from signs all over Ontario, including in Canada's biggest city. As protesters marched through Toronto's iconic Young Dundas Square last week, few probably realized that Dundas Street is a name now being scrutinized over Canada's history on race. Do you know where the name Dundas Street comes from? Actually, uh, no, I'm not sure. That person was Henry Dundas, Britain's Lord of the Admiralty more than 200 years ago. And when Toronto was being designed, a major street was named for him. But Henry Dundas also blocked Britain's abolition of slavery for 15 years. And that, say critics, is not a legacy Toronto should embrace by having the name Dundas emblazoned on street corners all over the city. They preserve the sense that there is something legitimate. Why would you want to identify with someone who opposed the abolition of slavery? Why would that be meaningful for anyone? Dundas is not just a major street name in Toronto. As you go west, it just keeps going. So other communities are also confronting the history of the name Dundas. Dundas Street carries on from Toronto through Mississauga and several more communities in southern Ontario all the way to London. In Hamilton, a community called Dundas still exists. In Woodstock, Dundas was a main street a century ago, and it still is today. And in London, Ontario, a major artery right through downtown. And its history there is also now being questioned. Right now, we're having a conversation about something that is very important, not only to a group of racialized community members, but as far as the nation is concerned. And I think this is where we're going to start to get some healing and understanding. Canada is not alone examining Henry Dundas. Some in Scotland want an enormous statue of the man taken down. Across Canada, many historic figures and symbols are now being viewed through the lens of racism. I believe in examining our history, criticizing it. Slavery existed in Canada, it existed in New France. We can't deny it. Um, we can't escape from it. In Toronto, thousands have petitioned to rename Dundas Street. No easy feat. Renaming a major street or public space does create many practical challenges. But we should have a process that can examine what are very important and relevant historical questions. 
In southern Ontario, millions are familiar with the name Dundas. Is it time to expunge or at least diminish its prominence in our midst? Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. That anger is about past injustices, but it's fueled by what's still happening today. Another video has been released in the United States showing the arrest of a black man. It's police body cam footage from Oklahoma City, and a warning, it is disturbing to watch. Police say 42-year-old Derek Scott was confronted after they received reports a man was brandishing a gun. Well, pinned to the ground, Scott says multiple times, I can't breathe. One officer says, I don't care. One had her knee between his shoulder blades, another straddled his back for about 13 minutes. I can't breathe. I can't breathe, please. Help me. He died shortly after his arrest. The video was released by police after Scott's family and a local Black Lives Matter group demanded more details. The officers have been cleared of any wrongdoing. Black activists are demanding it stop, demanding that black boys should not have to grow up wondering if they might be next. As Jackson Prosco reports, that's going to take leadership and a willingness to change, and there are no signs of that coming from the White House. The reckoning has come to every corner of America. A statue of Christopher Columbus toppled in Minneapolis. Confederate monuments ripped down in Virginia. The Confederate flag banned from all NASCAR events. And in Washington, a push to take down monuments inside the Capitol and to rename U.S. military bases named for Confederate generals. Through this national upheaval, President Donald Trump remains steadfastly on the opposite side, vowing to not even consider renaming bases, in the past objecting to the removal of monuments. And then you had the president make a case as to why a base should be named for them. He seems to be the only person left who doesn't get it. Trump has largely projected silence, even as those around him break theirs. It was a mistake that I've learned from. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff issued a public apology for appearing alongside the president after protesters were forcibly cleared from outside the White House to make way for a photo op last week. I should not have been there. My presence in that moment and in that environment created a perception of the military involved in domestic politics. Meanwhile, Trump himself has failed to address the issues of race that sparked the protests. His first scheduled campaign event in months is mired in racial overtones. Trump will speak to supporters in Tulsa, Oklahoma, site of one of the worst race massacres in U.S. history on the day known as Juneteenth, which commemorates the end of slavery. It's a slap in the face. I think it's a total insult to the black community and to the city of Tulsa for him to choose Juneteenth to come and kick off his campaign. That's unlikely to slow down a nation on the march toward change. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. Lots of Americans are calling for political change, and November's presidential election is fast approaching. Donald Trump's Democratic rival, Joe Biden, says he's worried Trump might refuse to relinquish power if he loses. In an interview on The Daily Show, host Trevor Noah asked Biden what his plan is to ensure everyone has the opportunity to cast a ballot without waiting in lines that are six hours long, the way people did in Georgia on Tuesday. It's my greatest concern, my single greatest concern, this president's going to try to steal this election. This is a guy who said that all mail-in ballots are fraudulent, direct, voting by mail, while he sits behind the desk in the Oval Office and writes his mail-in ballot to vote in the primary. The voting problems in Georgia's primary were terrible, from extremely long waits to malfunctioning voting machines. Some blame the state government for inadequate training. Others say it was about voter suppression tactics in a state with a history of racist election practices. Local and state officials are investigating why it went so wrong. The U.S. has marked another grim COVID-19 milestone. More than two million cases have now been diagnosed in that country. And in countries like Canada, where infection rates are relatively low, the World Health Organization is urging officials to remain on high alert. The biggest threat now, it says, is complacency. Almost 75% of recent cases come from just 10 countries, mostly in the Americas and South Asia. In Africa, the pandemic is accelerating. More than 200,000 cases have been confirmed there and more than 5,600 deaths. 
And more than 10,000 new infections were reported in India today, bringing the total in that country to more than 297,000. Here in Canada, Ontario recorded 203 new cases of COVID-19 today. That's the lowest number in nearly 11 weeks. Both Premier Doug Ford and his health minister, who themselves were tested yesterday, say the results are negative. And there's some good news for long-term care residents, too. Beginning June 18th in Ontario, visits will be allowed at the facilities that don't have COVID-19 outbreaks. There will be strict rules. They must take place outside. Visitors must remain physically distant and must have tested negative for the virus in the past two weeks. Well, many Canadians struggling to pay the bills are relying on federal emergency benefits. Now the Canada Revenue Agency says 190,000 Canadians who received CERB payments they weren't entitled to have repaid them. But the Liberal government has failed to secure enough political support to fast-track emergency legislation related to other benefits. Our chief political correspondent David Aiken joins me to explain what's at stake. David. Well, Donna, the legislation is known as Bill C-17, and it proposes to do quite a few things. First, it would provide for sanctions against anyone found to have fraudulently received any CERB payment, pay back twice what was illegally obtained, and pay a fine of up to $5,000 or face up to six months in jail. But C-17 does more than just that. It also provides a one-time $600 payment to anyone receiving the disability tax credit. It would also expand the wage subsidy program to include more seasonal workers. But C-17 is stalled because all three opposition parties refused unanimous consent needed to pass legislation in a single day. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau mostly blamed the Conservatives. So because they didn't get their way two weeks ago, they continue to complain and play politics and they blocked help to Canadians with disabilities. Conservatives rejected the accusation. Mr. Chair, the mistake yesterday was Liberals shamefully saying no to allow Parliament to deal with that legislation and then disgustingly today trying to play petty politics on the backs of people with disabilities. That's shameful, Mr. Chair. The Bloc Québécois wants the Trudeau government to table a fiscal update, while the NDP says limiting help only to those who file the tax return and claim the disability tax credit is wrong. The problem with the Liberal plan is it completely misses 60% of Canadians who live with a disability. Advocates for those with disabilities have one message for Ottawa, sort it out. The government really needs to assess where their values are at and the opposition needs to take a look at their response. Um, Canadians with disabilities make up 22% of the population and we are definitely voters. In the meantime, the Prime Minister said his government would try to find some other way to get this one-time $600 payment out the door to those who filed for a disability tax credit. Details? TBD, Donna. All right. David Aiken in Ottawa, thank you. The doctor being blamed for a COVID-19 outbreak in New Brunswick says he's not responsible and wants a public apology from the Premier. Dr. Jean-Robert Ngola says he's faced threats and attacks since the province announced an outbreak in Campbellton last month. It was linked to a doctor who came back from a trip to Quebec and did not self-isolate. Premier Blaine Higgs never publicly named Ngola, but the doctor's lawyer said today he was outed online. Ngola did travel to Quebec in May, but his lawyer says a private investigator found evidence the doctor contracted the virus in New Brunswick. There's no way to point the finger scientifically that Dr. Nogola is the cause of disease in New Brunswick, uh, certainly based on the contact tracing that uh, our investigator has done uh, and uh, based on the evidence. There, at the same time, there's, I don't think there's any way to point the finger at anybody because of the way this, this disease spreads. Ngola is seeking an apology, but his lawyer says he's not ruling out further legal action. Today, Premier Blaine Higgs stood by his statement, saying the facts are clear in this case and that he never identified the doctor. A new degree of anxiety for international students coming up, why their future is so uncertain during this pandemic. Everyone is trying to make plans for the future in the midst of the pandemic, including university students. New data from Ontario shows students are accepting university admissions offers at almost the same rate as before the pandemic. There are sharp contrasts among schools, but overall, there's almost no difference between this year and last, though much of the teaching 
will likely be done virtually. Enrollment numbers, especially from international students, is weighing heavily on schools across the country right now. Many post-secondary institutions rely on international students for funding. And as Mike LeCouture explains, there's concern some won't be able to return to class in the fall. Campuses across the country remain quiet as many post-secondary institutions have moved classes online for the foreseeable future. But that reduction in in-person learning won't mean a reduction in tuition. And that's significant for international students who often pay double compared to Canadian students at most post-secondary institutions. There should be an appropriate response in terms of tuition, so much we're paying since we are all, we are all affected by this. He launched a petition to convince his school to lower tuition for international students. Now, Dalhousie University recently announced it's raising tuition for all students by 3%, saying it will help maintain the high quality of academic programming. Now, the group that advocates for Canadian universities said in a statement, many universities are administering emergency bursaries and extending access to university residences for international students. Adding, Universities Canada is working with the federal government to help international students study in this country during the pandemic. All our efforts and investments might be in a risky. The tuition is a concern for Adelou Simsek, but a more pressing issue is whether or not school delays caused by the pandemic will prevent her from finishing her degree before her student visa expires. The program in this one year, it, it, it might be very tough uh, to find a job and get Canadian experience and get PR studies. It's why the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change is calling on the government to give all international students permanent residency status since many aren't eligible for emergency government aid. There's an economic downturn uh, making it difficult for students to find um, employment, even survival jobs and employment that would um, give them access to permanent residency. Good morning, everyone. In a statement, a spokesperson for the immigration minister responded, international students currently in Canada who had their classes moved online as part of efforts to flatten the curve of COVID-19 will not affect their eligibility for the post-graduation work permit program. Adding international students or other temporary residents can renew or extend their visas online. A helpful step, perhaps, but still not the long-term certainty those students are looking for. Mike LeCouture, Global News, Ottawa. Cash-strapped creativity still ahead. The airline selling art in turbulent times. Air Canada's CEO is calling for a loosening of travel restrictions so more people can fly. Callan Rovanescu calls the government's rules disproportionate. He wants the ability to do what he calls some reasonable amounts of business. Air Canada has laid off 20,000 employees, most international flights have been cancelled, and the U.S.-Canada border has been shut down to non-essential travel since March 21st. The restrictions are expected to be in place until at least late July. That's when Air Transat hopes to resume its flights after a nearly four-month hiatus. Starting July 23rd, the airline plans to offer 23 flights to places in Canada, the U.S., Europe and the Caribbean. New safety procedures will be in place. Air Transat reports it lost $179 million between February and May. To raise some much-needed cash and protect thousands of jobs, British Airways is auctioning off some art. At least 10 famous works that hang in the airline's lounges and headquarters are earmarked for sale. Some have been valued by Sotheby's auction house at over $1 million. This iconic alley in downtown Toronto has received a Black Lives Matter makeover. I'm Mike Curley. I'll explain more coming up on Global National. You're watching Global National. Art is inspired by life, and artists in Toronto are using their skills to express their views on current events and show solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. Mike Drolet takes us to Graffiti Alley. Tucked in behind all the glass towers and high fashion shops lies one of Toronto's unlikeliest attractions. It's called Graffiti Alley, street art that's become a magnet for Instagram posts, and which recently got a more socially aware makeover. 
I don't really see a lot of political work in our city, and so it's, it's, it's really beautiful to see it. The first mural painted really sets the tone for the rest of the alley. All Power to the People was a slogan for the Black Panther Party, which was a movement created in the 1960s initially to monitor police violence in the black community. Street art has long been viewed as an expression of the now, and there's no name more relevant to that idea than George Floyd, the Minneapolis man who died while being restrained by police. He's prominently displayed here, along with his last words, I can't breathe. Inside uh, the O of the lettering, you see the names listed of five people in 2020 who passed away under similar circumstances. So Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Douglas C. Lewis, David McAtee, and Regis Kochinski Paquette. In a way, art is his voice. What he paints here will speak to thousands through social media, people he otherwise would never meet. There is historic precedence. Thousands of murals were used as a way to stay connected in Northern Ireland during the Troubles. And most recently, Mexican artist Enrique Chu enlisted 3,800 volunteers to paint uplifting messages along the Mexican side of the border with the U.S. It's art, activism, and a message you have to paint over to a race. I think I'm not alone uh, as, a, as a white guy, a white person, um, feeling the pain of of uh, society, you know, Fe feeling agony watching what's happening and thinking and reading about what, you know, uh, how Canada is really not a whole lot better um, for people of color when it comes to police brutality. Graffiti won't solve society's ills, but it tells a story and hopefully reaches people who otherwise wouldn't listen. Mike Drolight, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Thursday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is the Shushwap River in Enderby, B.C. We'd love to see Your Canada. Please email it to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Robin Gill will be here tomorrow, and I will see you on Sunday for the new reality. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.